This episode is supported by Heinous, an Asian true crime podcast. Heinous is a revived look at the most heinous crimes that happened across Asia. Every Tuesday, join host Yo Kuang Jin as he digs into the key events of the crime, how the criminals grappled with their emotions and the human circumstances that led to the heinous actions. To stay up to date on the podcast, you can join your fellow heinous fans and interact with the team at or through the socials at heinous underscore one up media on Instagram and TikTok. Ghost Maps Entry 56 Taman Negara, Malaysia Alex laughs when they tell me what they do for a living. I'm a HR manager, they say. Somewhat sheepishly. Then they add with a smirk. And yes, I've heard all the jokes. We order our drinks at this posh coffee house in Chinatown. With a tight-lipped smile of my own, I confess that even I've heard some of the jokes they're talking about. Their favorite, Alex says, is how human resource managers lack any actual resources to help a company's humans. Very witty stuff, they say, rolling their eyes even as they let out a good-natured chuckle. They tell me that they understand where the mostly friendly jibes come from, though. A lot of companies I've worked for, the HR team's hamstrung by the higher-ups, they say, sounding more than a little annoyed. They pause suddenly, then let out another chuckle. (laughs) I know, I know. That's not what you wanted to talk to me about today. But I swear, it's um, important to tell you that before I get into the, uh, the incident. With that frustration creeping back into their tone, Alex tells me it was actually their upper management's cost-cutting that led to their story. I take that as my cue. As the waiter arrives with our drinks, I switch my recorder on and ask Alex to start from the beginning. It was 2018. Alex had been working for a pretty big multinational for about two years by that point. They'd been tasked with organizing a team-building trip to Tamanagara for the Singapore office's marketing division. One of those bond in the wilderness kind of things, you know? Alex says, their eyes rolling yet again. Each of these websites, they groan, was filled with meaningless buzzwords and pictures of overly cheery office workers. When they finally showed the list to upper management, however, they were very promptly rejected. Find something cheaper. That's what they were told. What Alex hadn't told them, though, was that they had already found a much cheaper alternative. Too cheap, in fact, Alex says. Which was a huge red flag already. It didn't help that this facilitator offered something called an off-the-beaten-track experience. Alex later learned this meant that the marketing team wouldn't be setting up in a legally designated camping spot. Instead, the facilitator, a perpetually grinning man named Marcus, promised to show them the quote-unquote real forest. Alex had gone through every other cheap alternative with her bosses, all of which were, likewise, promptly rejected too. Eventually, I just gave up and showed them that sketchy one, they say. The exasperation they had felt at the time showing on their face, even now. I expressed to them all my concerns, but they didn't care. All that mattered was that this one was, of course, cheap enough for them. Only eight people from marketing could go. The rest of the team 
were too busy with work to attend the team building trip. Alex laughs at the irony. They managed to piece together the full story of what happened in Tamanagara from those who weren't lucky enough to be bogged down by work. The trip had started out fun enough, they relate to me. An all-night train ride from Johor to Jarantut was followed by a too early but enjoyable breakfast. After another night's stay at a reasonably comfortable hotel, the group woke at the break of dawn. Marcus was waiting for them in the hotel's lobby, with a driver and a minibus parked outside that would take them to Taman Nagara. After a little less than an hour's drive, they entered the forest itself. Their driver, in the meantime, drove back to Jurantut. It didn't take long for the first signs of trouble to begin to show. Their trek was more treacherous than any of the team had expected. Pretty soon, it seemed like they were completely lost too. Marcus tried to placate them enthusiastically through his grin. Unsurprisingly, this didn't offer the team any reassurance. After an arduous hour and a half, they finally reached a clearing where Marcus proclaimed they would set up camp. Even though it was the middle of the afternoon on a sunny day, the clearing was ominously gloomy. It might have been the thick canopy overhead that blotted out the sun. But from the way the team had described it to Alex, it was also something else. Like there was a, a presence watching them, Alex tells me, their voice subconsciously dropping to a whisper. After they had set up, Marcus didn't bother with any kind of team-building activity, choosing instead to laze by his tent, smoking. He would tell them that the trek and the setup was enough team-building for the day, Alex says, laughing scornfully. After a while and enough protests from the team, Marcus relented and promised them a bonding exercise in the evening. The exercise, which began just as the sun was setting, seemed thrown together at the last minute. Marcus asked them to walk, in groups of three at a time, through the forest for about ten minutes, then make their way back to camp. I mean, can you imagine how dangerous that is? They were completely unsupervised, Alex says, shooting me a look of disbelief. There was uncertainty among the team. How was this team building? They asked him. He said something about having each other's backs or something equally vapid. They asked if it was safe. He waved them off and said he would look after them. After a while, three junior executives, Sue, Ferdowus, and Eddie, decided to hell with it and stepped up. Armed with just one torchlight, the trio started forward into the forest, trying their best to stick to a slightly worn dirt path. And from the relative safety of the clearing, Marcus cheered them on, promising them again that they were safe. The three execs managed to stick to the path for five minutes even as the forest very quickly grew darker. Sue switched the torchlight on, but it did nothing to dispel a creeping sense of claustrophobia that slowly overcame them. It could have been the fact that the path was becoming narrower, and the surrounding bushes seemingly closing in on them. 
It could have been the imposingly tall trees all around. Or it could have been the feeling that they weren't alone. Eddie came across as particularly shaken by their predicament. He seemed to sue in Ferdowus, like he kept veering off the path, almost falling into the bushes a couple of times. Sue finally stopped and turned around completely to ask Eddie if there was anything wrong, but he wordlessly shook his head. He appeared more confused than anything else, Sue had told Alex, almost like he couldn't figure out why he was veering off the path himself. And as Sue turned back to face forward again, the light from her flashlight passed over Eddie's feet. And that's when she saw it. A pair of bare feet. Between Eddie and Ferdaus. She caught just a glance of it. She could relate almost every detail to Alex. Its nails were long and chipped, with dirt under them, Alex tells me. The skin was nearly translucent, which made the sickly blue-green veins stand out even more. Sue had never seen a dead body before, but she had told Alex she was absolutely certain that those feet couldn't have belonged to anyone alive. Sue immediately instructed her colleagues to run back to the clearing. She must have sounded terrified, because Ferdaus and Eddie didn't ask any questions. They just sprinted as fast as they could up the dirt path. As they made their way back, however, Fadaus saw something from the corner of his eye. He didn't get a good look at it, but he could tell that it was pale and round, and it looked like it was flying amidst the inky blackness of the surrounding trees. I outright asked him if he thought it was a head, Alex says. I mean, after ghostly feet, that doesn't seem like a stretch, right? They chuckle again, but mirthlessly this time. Fedawas had reiterated to Alex that he didn't get a good look at it. But Alex suspects that he was more certain than he let on. They pause a while now, and shake their head and continue. Anyway, when Ferdows, Eddie, and Sue finally reached the clearing again, they told the rest what had happened. A nervous energy radiated among everyone. As their eyes darted around, panic bubbling just beneath the surface. Well, everyone except Marcus. Still grinning, he tried to reassure the team again. But this time, no one was having it. They were scheduled to stay out in the forest for two nights but they demanded that he take them back the following morning. And he made excuses. The minibus couldn't come back till the designated date, and they would still have to pay the full amount. The team didn't care. Finally, he nodded and promised them that he'll try in the morning. He went to his tent, still grinning, almost wider than before. The team stayed up all night, huddling together around their lamps, 
and trying to distract themselves by talking about anything else. Work, their personal lives, anything but what was out there. Watching them. The next morning, the team, exhausted from the trek the day before and the lack of sleep, went to Marcus's tent to demand that he bring them back to Gerantut. But somehow, he was gone. They kept their wits about them, Alex tells me, sounding genuinely proud of their now ex-colleagues. They wandered around vaguely towards the direction that they thought they had come from the previous day, yelling out for help constantly. Eventually, a pair of rangers found them and helped them to get back to civilization. After the team had returned to work a few days later and Alex had gotten the full story, they had tried to contact Marcus's company again to demand answers. But their emails bounced back. Their calls couldn't go through. Even Marcus's website was gone, like it never even existed. I ask Alex if they have their own suspicions about the whole incident. I do, Alex says. But at the end of the day, he's not the one I blame. I nod in agreement. We're both silent for a moment. Then I crack a smile and tell them that if it's any consolation, they're definitely the most human human resource manager I've ever met. Alex laughs loudly, then says, Good luck trying to convince my colleagues of that. If you want to discover more of Southeast Asia's other side, subscribe now and follow us on social media. You can also be one of our supporters on Patreon. Look for We Are Hantu or click the links in the description. Ghost Maps is a Huntu production, created by Kyle Ong and Wayne Ray, with art direction by Jolene Lim, and recorded on Audio Technica mics. <laughs> <laughs>